institutions in, in Berks County. We're focused on improving the health, wealth, and education attainment of the citizens of, of Berks County. And we're really focused on community building and community development. And these um, monthly programs that we provide are geared toward trying to make sure that our community is informed on some of the most uh, critical issues that are shaping you know, where we're going as a community. And I think, uh, as hopefully everybody knows, there is so much positive going on right now in Berks County that I'm really encouraged about the trajectory that, that we're, we're on. And we really have, as a community, a lot to be uh, grateful and, and thankful for. So uh, I'll turn it back to Dave, who's gonna give you a, a few uh, rules of the road, and then he'll introduce Rich and, and Mike Toledo. But I can't thank uh, all of you enough for supporting uh, these, uh, these sessions that we do. So thanks for being with us today. Thanks, John. And, and again, I want to welcome everybody to uh, this event. Hopefully you find it uh, as important and significant as what I think it, I think it's going to be. Um, a few ground rules that we want to cover before we get started. Uh, we ask that you mute your microphone um, so that you can continue to have conversations if you need to, but we're not all engaged in them. Uh, leave your camera on so we can see you because it's always nice to see real people, even if it's only on small boxes and videos. Uh, we uh, will do our presentation. Feel free to enter questions and comments in the chat function. Um, I'll be assembling those uh, questions and comments and raise them as we get to the end of the presentation. Hopefully we get through all of them, but if we don't, we will share them with Rich and Mike Toledo. And if they have responses they'd like us to share back, we will do that and send it out to everybody. We are recording this uh, program. Uh, we will make it available on the uh, Berks Alliance website. We'll be sharing it with BCTV and we send it, the copy of it to everyone who registers for the program. So you will be getting a copy of the video. Thanks to Mike Toledo, we're going to also be having it translated into Spanish and, and all those places I talked about it being posted, it will be made available and it will also be posted on the Centro Hispano uh, website as well in both English and Spanish. So thank you, Mike, for doing that. And thank you, uh, hopefully you look forward to that. Um, we uh, will, as I said, we will share that video with everybody who is uh, here. Mike has uh, sent the link out already in the chat function uh, of how to access the report that Rich and Mike have, have created, Harwood Group created. Uh, please feel free to use that. Please feel free to distribute that to anybody you think might be interested. It's a very interesting uh, report. So with that, I think that's all the ground rules. Uh, I'm going to introduce Mike Toledo, who is the executive director CEO of Centro Hispano and was sort of the, the force that led the, uh, this project. Mike. Thank you, Dave. And, and, and thank you, John, for in the Alliance for allowing us the opportunity to be able to share uh, the work uh, that has been done over the last year as, as it relates to this report. Again, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, just as a, uh, just a brief intro on the Hispanic Center for those that maybe are not familiar with the work of the Hispanic Center. Uh, the Hispanic Center, the Centro Hispano has been serving um, our greater Reading uh, community for over 55 plus years. Uh, our mission is to help support the acculturation of the growing Latino uh, community and population of Greater Reading and Berks. And we do that through collaborative initiatives uh, to help improve the quality of life for those families that we serve and the neighborhoods uh, of, the, of the communities that they live in. You know, these, uh, our ability to be able to have a positive impact in the community is really done through partnerships, strategic partnerships that help us uh, to be able to move the needle in our community. Um, and this report, which uh, we'll, we'll talk about this morning, is, is a great example of how you know, two organizations and many more thereafter um, helped us to really take a deep dive on a, what a, a community-driven agenda uh, for education means in our greater Reading community. Um, you know, the Hispanic Center 
under the, the, the leadership of uh, Dr. Raquel Yinkst, who is uh, on our call today, has been, you know, when you look at education and the Mount Rushmore of folks advocating for education, uh, you know, Dr. Raquel has to be on that, uh, on that Mount Rushmore. So for us to take the deep dive that we did on education and what we as a community could do as it relates to taking education to the next level in our community, uh, again, it's the work that she done many years ago that's led to the efforts that we have here that we're going to share today. Again, you'll be hearing from our good friend Richard Harwood of the Harwood Institute. Rich and his organization and his team were instrumental in partnering and working with the Hispanic Center uh, to do outreach in the community, uh, holding multiple community conversations to different neighborhoods conducting uh, community conversations in English and in Spanish, and also reaching out to the community, to community leaders to really get a pulse on what a community-driven agenda for education might look like for Reading. So without further ado, again, I wanna thank you all again for being a part of this this morning. Um, we welcome questions, comments, feedback on what you hear today, and uh, Rich and I look forward to answering any questions that you may all have. Again, we're only as strong as the team that we have around us, and we appreciate the time you're taking today to learn about the work that we have done over the last uh, 16 months. Rich, please take it away, my friend. Great. Thanks so much, Mike. Hey, it's great to be with everyone uh, Dave, thanks uh, for having us. John, always good to see you again. Um, I see a number of, uh, of new friends on this call and um, it's, I wish I were in Reading with you uh, physically, uh, but uh, as Dave said earlier, this will have to do for now. And uh, I'm just uh, delighted to be with you. Um, I'm gonna talk um, in a minute about this report and what we think some of the implications are for Reading moving forward. As John said, there's, this is a great time to be in writing, a lot of good energy. I want to talk about that. Before I do, I just want to take a couple of minutes, just since um, many of you may not know about the Harwood and Super Republican Innovation and, and what really motivates us um, to do this work. I just want to take a few minutes just to give you a quick introduction to that so you have a little context about where we're coming from. Um, our organization um, works to bridge divides in the country to create a culture of shared responsibility in communities and to make community a common enterprise again so that everyone in communities can move forward together. And at the heart of our work is how do we build the capacities of communities to strengthen a community's capabilities to shape and drive their own future? And not to keep having consultants and other groups descending upon your community telling you what to do from the outside when they don't really understand the community. Um, how is it that we can build those capacities. Our work has spread to all 50 states in the US and to 40 countries around the globe. And we've been doing this work now for over 30 years. Um, I started it um, when I was 27 years old, um, which I know, you know, Dave and I were talking about this before the call. I know that it just looks like I probably, how could I have been doing this for 30 years? Because it probably looks like I just started two years ago. Um, but in fact, it is really 30 years. And, um, and, you know, I started for four reasons. One is that I worked on 20 political campaigns by the time I was 23 years old, the last one I was an aide to a presidential candidate. And a lot of those candidates were good people, but their campaigns at that time um, were simply about winning at any cost and dividing Americans at any cost. Things, have, as you know, have only gotten worse in the last 30 years. I worked for a couple of nonprofits that had wonderful missions, and I'm still in touch with those groups. But I was frustrated with a lot of nonprofits, and we are a nonprofit. I was frustrated that too many didn't want to get dirt under their fingernails and do the hard work that we actually need to do to move communities forward and to ensure that every American has the opportunity to fulfill their potential and be part of America's promise. I started this because I'm a person of faith, like many of you, perhaps. Um, where my faith calls me to do this work. And I started it, unfortunately, because as a child, I was diagnosed with cystic fibrosis. And in the early 1960s, when I was diagnosed, that was a death sentence. So my family went on a death watch 
um, because it was predicted that I would be, it was expected that I would be dead by the time I was five years old. Uh, luckily, my diagnosis when I got older changed, but the damage was already done because what I learned from that experience and what I bring with me in this work every single day is that a system that was supposed to help heal me chewed me up and spit me out. That I learned really early on, as many folks in Reading have learned, what it feels like to have your dignity stripped from you. I learned as a young child what it feels like not to have a voice and to have everyone surrounding my hospital bed talking about me, but never talking with me. And that continued well into my 20s and 30s. And so all of these things and others motivate me each and every day to do this work. And they motivate me to be here today with you. And I think that's really important for you to know what's really behind this work and what's motivating it. The work that Mike and I and the Centro Hispano and, and the Harwood Institute teamed up, and then as Mike said, lots of other folks in the community came together around. Um, we did it by uh, interviewing 36 leaders across your great community. We did it by doing 16 community conversations in every neighborhood in Reading that you can imagine, five or six of them in all Spanish. And I just wanna underscore that that this report, while it's about education, is not about the Reading Public Schools. I've talked to Dr. Murray and Dr. Sanchez about this many times now. This really is about how does a community take responsibility for its young people, a sense of shared responsibility, and do that alongside with and along with the public schools. As you know, too often we see all the social challenges and things that we want to achieve in our communities and we place them at the schoolhouse door and walk away. And what I have assured Dr. Murray is that that's not what this report's about. This is not a report cut on the Reading Public Schools. This is a report about how Reading as a community can come together and ensure that every young person in your community can succeed and every family can achieve their goals moving forward. I can't underscore that enough. It's also about how does a community gain hope and move forward and continue on a trajectory of hope. So I just wanna build on what John said when he opened up this morning, that there are a lot of good things happening in Reading and our approach is about building on the assets and the good things of communities, not focusing on the negative things. So there are lots of good things to build on in Reading. Your community is changing. There's a lot of new energy in this community, as you know. There's downtown development occurring. Now, I know it's not happening as fast as many of you want it to be. Shannon and I were talking about this before the call started uh, today, but there is new development occurring. It's happening. There are good initiatives across your community already taking place. A lot of good initiatives. They're, they're detailed and, and in a sense cataloged in this report that we've produced. Uh, but they're happening from places like BCIU, they're happening from RAC, they're happening from Olivet. I've talked to Chris Winters many times, a couple of times about this. They're happening from the Hispanic Center. They're happening from the United Way. They're happening from Brooks Alliance, right? There's new and young emerging leaders uh, um, taking place in non-traditional leaders that the Wild Missing Foundation is helping to support in your community. They're there, people in your community see them, they recognize them, they lift them up and name them. There's lots of catalytic organizations in your community that are working. Many of the ones I've already mentioned that are doing really good things. You know, I work in lots of communities where the communities are really down and out. We're doing work in Jackson, Mississippi right now, one of the poorest communities, hardest hit communities in all of America. And it is tough to generate change in that community. And those folks are doing incredible work and making incredible efforts. Reading is not in the same position as Jackson, Mississippi. There is a sense of energy, a sense of desire, a, a hope to move forward. And there is already good things happening to build on that I think is really important. Now, what's it gonna take for writing to get to the next stage? What's it going to take for writing to get to the next stage? And I just wanna highlight a couple of things, not to highlight the problems, but to highlight places where we can build and work to help accelerate and deepen progress in this community. Too many com people in your community do believe they do not have a voice. They believe they do not have a voice. They believe that when forums are set up, no one's really listening. And then we believe even when people are listening that there aren't actions taken that actually respond to the, their concerns and what really matters to them. 
I could talk to you for hours about all sorts of processes that are really important here and all sorts of things about civic engagement, but let me just give you a really simple equation. When people believe that their voice has not been heard, it means them they believe that their reality has not been accounted for. And when people believe their reality has not been accounted for, they believe their dignity has been stripped from them. It's that simple. And so if we want to help marshal the resources and the energy and the talents and the capabilities of the folks who live in Reading and make it their home, then we're gonna to have to make sure they believe their voice has been heard in authentic, genuine, real and deep ways. There are divides in your community. I don't need to tell you this. There are divides by geography. There are divides by Berks County versus the rest of Reading, the donut hole, the so-called donut hole that people talk about. There are silos between and among organizations that are preventing groups from working together collaboratively to really marshal the collective energy and talents of this community. I remember one person in the report said, you know, you can walk three blocks in any direction. It feels like you're in a different community, right? And so the question is, how do you bridge these divides? Here's the good news. I work in a lot of communities like Alamance County, North Carolina, where we're doing work, where there are factions where people are working against each other that need to be brought together. That's not Reading. That's a, that's a certain type of challenge one needs to deal with. In Reading, it's just that people feel separated from one another. And the question is, how do we bridge those divides and bring folks together? That's a different challenge. It's actually one that's much more doable. That's the good news. There is a a history, I guess I would call it, of negativity in Reading. I need to tell you, you were named the poorest community in America 10 years ago. That article still dogs the community. There is a sense that positive change sometimes can't happen here, that we have false, as someone said to me the other day, we have false, someone in Reading said to me the other day, actually two days ago, that we have false starts here, a history of false starts. And we don't always follow through on our initiatives. And so the question is, how do we combat that negativity? There are ways to do that. And then lastly, one thing I just want to point out is that there is a lack of shared people say, I didn't make this up, people say there is a lack of shared purpose in the community. We're not all pulling in the same direction. We are not all working in unison, not in coordinated ways, but in mutually reinforcing ways. And people said to us over and over again, in order for this community to get to its next stage, to keep progressing, to accelerate its progress, to deepen its progress, we're gonna to need to develop a much stronger sense of shared purpose. Now, before I get into these recommendations that uh, this agenda that Mike was talking about, um, let me just say a couple of things about it. If you've read the report or if you read it after we have this uh, conversation today, and I hope you will read it, um, there are nine recommendations. There's an agenda with nine agenda items. And each of them are important. All of them are important. But what I would say to you and what I say to all communities that we work with, that no community should try to work on nine things at once. Our intent here is to help articulate what the community said is an agenda for moving forward. I believe that in order for Reading to make progress, you probably wanna peel off two or three of these things to get started with. So the goal here is not to act on all nine, it's to figure out where there's energy, where we can bring some folks together who wanna to create a sense of shared purpose and how we can move. That's one part. A second thing I would mention here is that there is no single organization or leader or group that can solve the challenges or meet the challenges that Reading faces moving forward. John references in terms of how Burke's Alliance operates, right? The Hispanic Center, the same thing. While I'm missing, I know Karen and Pat are on this call, the same thing. And so we can't look for the hero. We can't look for the single organization. We can't look for the single group. It's gonna take all of us. It's gonna take all of us to move things forward. Third, the way the Institute thinks about change, I just wrote a book about this. I'm not trying to plug the book, but I'd love for you to buy it. Um, it's called Unleashed, um, is 
uh, where we document nine stories from different communities and create a framework. And what we've come to know about our work over 30 years is that change gets unleashed in communities and it grows like a positive contagion over time. It's not done in one fell swoop. It's not done through one initiative. It doesn't happen all at once. And so the question is not how do you create all the change that you wanna create on these agenda items, but how do you get this chain reaction catalyzed? How do you get it started? How do you get it moving? And so there, what becomes really important is how can we get some early wins out of the gate to demonstrate that change is possible, that we're gonna make efforts over time that they can grow as opposed to diminish and we won't have a false start. So that's really critical here. I also wanna mention that in order to do this work for Reading, and this is true in most communities that we work with, we've got to keep coming back to creating a shared purpose. It's not enough to just create new initiatives. We've got to create a shared purpose so that we're all moving in a common direction, not coordinated necessarily, but in mutually reinforcing ways. And then the last thing I want to mention is this. It's a saying we have at the Institute, but it, actually has come to mean a lot to me. How you do the work is as important as what you do. How you do the work is as important as what you do. We could create, as I was just mentioning, really nice new shiny initiatives. We could create new programs. We could create all sorts of new collaborations. But if we actually don't work differently, if we actually don't come to the table and show up differently, if we actually don't really tap into the community's voice and really listen, not because we're just trying to take the pulse of the community, but because we wanna know what matters to people. If we're not really figuring out how we can work together, not just coordinating efforts, that's easy. I'm talking about actually having real conversations, often hard conversations about what it's gonna to take to actually make a difference in people's lives and in this community. If we're not committed to those things there isn't enough or there aren't enough initiatives and shiny new objects and processes that we can rig up that's gonna move communities forward. And I think this is one of the greatest challenge American communities face. And as I said, our work has spread to 40 countries. I was in Israel not too long ago. It's the, it's the challenge in Israel, the challenge in our work in Australia, the challenge in our work in Canada. It's the challenge wherever our work is. So these are all really important. You still with me? Just give me a nod, thumbs up. No one's asleep yet? All right. So let me just spend a few minutes, if it's okay, talking about this agenda. I won't belabor it, but I do wanna highlight some key points just so you know it's here. And then, um, and then I wanna end by tying Reading to a national study of the Institute just released and why I think what you're doing in Reading is so important. So we have these nine agenda items. The first one is this, make education a community enterprise, meaning let's pull together and solve some problems. And I think the thing that pops up here the fastest is around after school activities. How is it, you've got a lot of kids, particularly coming out of COVID who are not engaging. I've talked to Chris Winters at Olivet about this. I've talked to, to Mike at the Hispanic Center. I've talked to other folks throughout writing about this. You've got a lot of kids who are out there on their own after school with no place to go. How is it that we can come together as a community and build after school programs and make sure they're connected to the schools? So it's not just activities, but kids are actually deepening their learning and their capability to ensure that they're succeeding in school and in life. So how is it that we can come together and do that? Second, how do you provide more pathways for young people to win? This could be around, I know Dan's on the call here. This could be, he and I've talked about this. This could be around vocational training. It could be around apprenticeships. It could be around job readiness. It could be around planning tools to plan for what happens after. Here's the thing. As you know, we all know, lots of young people don't go on to college, right? That's true across the country, not just in Reading. But in so many places where we're doing work, not just here in Reading, but in Lexington, Kentucky, where we're about to release the report, and in Clarksville, Tennessee, where we're about to release a report, what young people and their families tell us is, if we're not going off to college, 
we don't feel like anyone's helping us enough to figure out our pathway forward so that we can succeed in life. We heard that in Reading also. You're not alone in this, but it's important. And so how do we make sure we're providing the pathways and how do we make sure families know about these pathways? And how do we make sure we're engaging them in ways that meet them where they are, as opposed to just pushing programs at them? That's gonna be really important. Third, English as a second language or literacy. This is a big issue that we heard from lots of folks in your community. As you know better than I do, lots of folks came to America um, as adults. Lots of folks came to America um, already speaking a native language as young people. And to me, this is a fundamental equity issue. What people told us in Reading is, if I don't know English well enough, I can't navigate this world that we live in and I can't make my way forward in it. And it really limits my ability to participate in America's promise. And so we heard from people over and over and over again, we need to learn English. We need to make this a bigger priority in writing than it already is. We've got to come together and work together in new partnerships around this. I can't underscore enough that for, for me at least, this is a fundamental equity issue about whether or not everyone really has an opportunity to participate in America's promise moving forward. Fourth, create more mental health support for young people. I've talked to Dr. Sanchez a lot about this. I've talked to others about it. You have 18,000 young people in Reading Public Schools, 18,000. And the Reading Public Schools should be proud as they are that they have put a counselor in every single school in your school district. That's a great achievement. But here's the thing, 18,000 kids. We need to wrap our arms around these kids, particularly coming out of COVID. And it's not just suicide, which is obviously a major issue and your numbers are up in Berks County, as you probably know, but it's a major issue in terms of everything from how do we make sure that there's um, mental health support for, for kids who are just struggling or for kids who have been traumatized in their young uh, adult life or for kids who don't know how to deal with the challenge around bullying or for kids, frankly, who just need a loving adult in their life because we know how important that is for the development of young people. And so I think we've got to frame this mental health issue as a much larger spectrum or continuum of care and support or a web that we need to provide for young people in Reading and frankly, all across our country. Um, so it's great. And I've said this many times publicly, it is great that Reading Public Schools has put a counselor or a social worker in every public school. That's a real achievement. But let's remember you have 18,000 kids, 18,000. Five, give families more of a voice in education. This is really critical. Uh, and there's also a spectrum here. So this could involve everything from how do families and young people have access to resources and know what those resources really are, to how do parents learn how to advocate for their child and for their families and engage in parent-teacher conferences, which as you know, if you're a parent, that's not easy for any of us sometimes. I'm a parent of two kids. Well, they're not kids anymore, they're, they're 32 and 29. But I remember those parent-teacher conferences, sitting in those small chairs, I was nervous. Um, so you know, how do we do that? And how do we ensure that parents and really the larger community has a voice in major education choices that we face as a community, whether it's about how to deal with violence at your high school, which I know you've been wrestling with, to how do we set priorities for federal dollars, to how do we set priorities for what's really important around education for our kids in this community. Education is the clearest reflection of whether or not people believe, as you know, in terms of what's happening with school boards around the country, a clearest reflection of what people believe they can shape their future in their communities. They need a voice in order to do that. Number six, hire and retain teachers who look like Reading. Uh, this is really critical. Um, as you know, um, Reading has been working on this. Reading Public Schools, I believe, are out 
pacing other school districts in the state, but the numbers are still low. Dr. Murray and I have talked about this. There's more work to do here. I know that the state, the Commonwealth, um, has all sorts of restrictions that need to be changed and rules. Uh, but the question is, you know, I know United Way is working on this, how do we create pipelines of young people who want to be teachers? And frankly, how do we make sure that we're sending signals to current teachers that we value them and we support them? And that's a really critical issue. Seven, define a new com uh, community vision for educational success. Um, people really had a lot to say about this when we engaged with them. They really wanted to talk about how is it that different kids learn? Different kids with different learning styles learn. How do we make sure that we're accounting for that? How do we make sure that we have a vision for education that doesn't simply state or imply that if you go to college, you're doing well. If you're not going to college, something wrong has happened. How do we make sure that we're valuing all options, as I talked about before, that are really critical? People talked about how do we make sure that when we're valuing education, we're valuing what it means to become a citizen? I'm not talking about legal things here. I'm talking about small c citizen and member of a community. How do we value that? How do, how do we value what it means to be a good person in the world, an engaged person, a person who works with other people? And people are saying we need a broader vision of success for education in Reading. Let me just be clear, people are not saying that they want to set pedagogy for the Reading Public Schools. They're talking about how is it that a community raises its young people and not just what happens in the Reading Public Schools, but happens in our communities as well. Two last things really quickly. Develop and strengthen pre-K. Pre um, there's a lot of good work already taking place in Reading on this. BCIU is doing good work. RAC is doing work. United Way has been doing work and is expanding their work. Others of you are doing work on this. But as you know, it's not enough yet, yet. Um, as you know, the state um, gives, what is it, keystones for different um, early childhood uh, providers. And um, there aren't a whole lot that are ranked really highly in Reading right now. Uh, a lot of the providers are providing, um, they're watching kids, they're not providing educational uh, experiences for kids to make sure that they're getting off to a good start. This is a tough issue. And the question here is, how do we make sure we're engaging parents and families so we know what they're literally looking for and the obstacles they need to overcome in order to make sure that we're meeting them where they are? How do we make sure that the people who are working with our children are prepared to do that and are effective at doing it? How do we make sure that providers are coming together and working in a way that really has the community in their line of sight at all times? And then lastly, clear a new path for investments um, uh, and priorities uh, or funding priorities for education in Reading. I know that there's a, um, a lawsuit uh, against the Commonwealth, and my understanding is that that's still that's still ongoing, and it's uh, clear that Reading is being underfunded by the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Let me just be really clear about that. At the same time, while those efforts are un, un, are undergoing, the question is, what does Reading do to get more control of its own future? How do we set greater priorities in this community about what we want to fund in education? How do we set greater priorities for how we marshal the resources we already have or the resources we could pull together? And so people want clear action from the Commonwealth, that's for sure, but they also want Reading to take a greater sense of control over their own future. So let me just conclude with a couple of really quick thoughts if I can, and then um, Dave, hopefully we can, we can open it up for a conversation. Uh, some of you may know that the Institute just released a new study uh, called Civic Virus, Why Polarization is a Misdiagnosis. It's a national study. We did it all across America. And um, I was just on Meet the Press with Chuck Todd uh, last week, I believe, um, speaking about it. In essence, the report says that the conventional wisdom about America being polarized is wrong, that the challenge that we face in the country is much more profound, in fact, more dangerous and more perilous to our country. We are facing a civic virus. 
that started long before the pandemic of the last two or three years. We Americans are separating and segregating ourselves from one another, and we're doing so more so as we feel more anxious um, about what's happening around us and in, in our lives. Our political leaders, the news media and social media are intentionally manufacturing and stoking polarization to further divide us so that they can win their own political battles, gain for their own benefit, rack up their own ratings, and it is creating a kind of surround sound that is creating an alternate reality for so many of us that is confusing, disoriented, dizzying, um, and, uh, and really destabilizing uh, is what people told us. Because people see no way out of this, uh, it's not polarization that we're engaged in, it's a basic human response to fear and disorientation, which is a fight or flight response. People are in a fight or flight, flight response. So some people are joining smaller and smaller groups where they believe that their voice can be heard and they'll be accepted and validated and they can fight it out with others because they're so fearful about what might happen and other people have retreated altogether from public life. Now, why am I mentioning this? Because I think what we're talking about in Reading is an antidote to what's happening in the country. I wrote an op-ed for USA Today that's coming out in the next couple of days where I actually lifted up Reading in the op-ed and said, at a time across the country when it comes to education, where we are fighting over masks in public schools, we're banning books, where we are, where people are storming uh, school boards to take over and other things are occurring. And we're in fights over critical race theory. Reading, Pennsylvania came together to create a community driven agenda about how a community can take shared responsibility for its young people and move forward in spite of these national debates that are occurring. So it is possible for a community to come together and do this work. And so I believe in closing, I'll just say, I believe we face a fundamental choice in the country right now. And I think Reading can help us in this. We can either surrender to this false notion of polarization in America and throw up our hands and walk away or engage in more fight or flight, or we can commit ourselves to rebuilding this country and finding a better, more fair, a more just, a more equitable, a more inclusive, a more hopeful path forward, not just for some of us, but for all of us. And it seems to me at the heart of it, that's what this work in this report is really about. We need to inoculate ourselves against this civic virus in the country and Reading can help demonstrate what that looks like and why it's so important to do and what success looks like moving forward. So let me stop there. I probably took more time, Dave, than you wanted me to. No, this was great, John. Hey, Rich, this is very, very good. Um, I'd like you to talk a little bit more about some of the positive things that you said you saw in Reading that ins inspired your use of us in this op-ed that you're talking about. What, what is it that you see bubbling here that you think we have to build on, we can take advantage of? First of all, I think, you know, I didn't say this in the op-ed, but I'm going to say it in other pieces there. First of all, I think Reading represents the new America, right? Your population makeup has fundamentally shifted, yes. right? Fundamentally shifted. Your economy, you were the poorest community 10 years ago when that article came out. That's no longer the case. And you are sort of, a, I want to say, chugging along like the little engine that could, except with Reading, that's probably not the right thing, <laughs> you know. Uh, maybe that's the appropriate thing to say, but in fact, uh, you are moving along as a community and demonstrating that you, this community and all American communities that are wrestling right now with these challenges don't have to settle for where you are, that you can come together and build. You have higher education institutions that are reinvesting in your downtown and making a go of it. Um, you have, um, you know, a United Way that got a Mackenzie Scott Award, which is a really unusual and unique thing that everyone should be proud of, that is trying to use that to leverage change in the community. You have um, a philanthropic community like the Wyoming Missing Foundation and others that are stepping forward and trying to develop non-traditional leaders and bring people together in, in other ways. 
you have a Reading Public Library that is a really good, I, you know, I've worked with libraries across the country. There are thousands of public libraries using our work across America. You have a really fine library that's doing good work. So I think there are lots of great assets in this community to build on. And the other thing I would say, Dave, is that there is a yearning. One of the things I always look for when we work with communities is, is there a yearning to build on the good things that are happening while we have our eyes wide open to the challenges that remain and that we're not going to try to hide from those challenges. We're gonna to try to tackle them and demonstrate that we can move on them. And that's the spirit that I felt in Reading. Uh, and I think that's really important. That's, that's really encouraging. I think you're right. There's a sort of history of negativity here in a sense of, well, you know, we're the poorest city in the country and da, 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 da. But I, I think it's important for us. And I think I, I really personally value you saying that these positive things, these positive attributes that you've seen in Reading that may not be replicated or as present in other places, but become a platform for us to uh, begin to make significant change. Yeah, um, and the, go ahead. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. No, this is the other thing, Dave. No, no, no. The other thing that's really encouraging about it is that you're growing. You know, this in this book, Unleashed, it's about one of the things we talk a lot about is that communities grow their strength and they grow initiatives. Doesn't mean that you don't look at what other communities are doing and understand things that you can you can build on. But but the good thing, the really positive thing and the really hopeful thing about what Reading is doing is that you're growing a lot of these things from the inside out. And um, I think that's really critical because that means it's stronger. It's, it's woven into the fabric of the community more. There's, it's, more it's usually more sustainable that way than if you're just importing stuff and plugging and playing in the community, which is what a lot of communities try to do, and it doesn't tend to work. You talked uh, early on about uh, the, the need for a shared sense of purpose. And it sounds like underlying what, you, what your report produces is a sense that we need to find ways to empower all of the youth of Reading, that that's really the future of this community. Do you have any, any more thoughts about that? Any suggestions about how we go about doing that? Yeah, you know, I'm, in the report? well, you know, I think, um, you know, let's just take uh, um, providing support to to young people. I mean, I think, well, 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 let me answer it this way. A lot of organizations and groups when they're doing work in communities are kind of hunkered down and they're looking inward toward themselves. And they're looking inward toward themselves. We've done millions of dollars of research and work on this. They're looking inward towards themselves because they're overly concerned about their own strategies, their own metrics, their own funding, the credit that they get in the media from other groups. So it's an inwardness. So one of the first things I would say that's really important is that we've got to change our orientation, our mindset, our posture. We have to embrace, I believe, a posture of being turned outward toward the community. Because Dave, within our communities, we have all sorts of innate capabilities that we don't necessarily value. Let's take education as one example, since that's what we're talking about today. We often think that the only people who have something to offer on education are people who are certified to teach or people who have a PhD. And yes, they have a lot to offer and we need them. But you know, parents have a lot to offer because they know their kids and they know other kids and they have the trust of kids in their neighborhoods. Shopkeepers and other people in communities have a lot to offer because they can support kids and make sure that we're watching out for them. Different organizations like Olivet and the Hispanic Center and others have lots to offer because they're interacting with kids every day and young people every day. Think about all the assets that we're tapping now and then exponentially multiply them because that's probably what exists in our community today. And the question is, how do we activate that with purpose? Not just people running around, but with purpose. Right. How do we activate it so people feel like they're doing something meaningful and important and their contribution matters? That's important. Yeah, and, and to that point, one of the things you mentioned early on was it's probably more important how we do this than what we're doing. Could you talk about that a little bit? Because I think that's, that's a significant thing we need to embed here. Yeah, I think, 
Um, I think how we, you know, when we were working in, in, in Spokane, Washington, and we were working on education issues, and the way in which the issues were framed there was that we had a high school graduation challenge. And then they did some more traditional research and they realized we have a middle school problem. And so they started creating all these programs where they wanted to start arranging all this funding. And then our partner, which was a United Way there, started to engage the community and young people and parents about what was really going on. And what they realized was that middle school age kids were having trouble making transitions in their lives. So this wasn't actually an education challenge, this was an adolescent challenge. So it went from a school problem around graduation to we actually have a community challenge here about how we help kids make a transition when they're adolescents. That led to, so that's one part. That meant whether it's like on pre-K or mental health, you know, in the terms of the writing agenda items, are we really listening to the community? Do we really understand what matters? Do we really understand what's going on in people's lives in a deep way so that we actually can address what's actually happening and not just run off with new programs? Because I don't know about you, there's limited dollars in the world. I wanna protect our investments and make sure they pay off. So that's one thing. Second, when they started to do this work, instead of looking to teachers first, they said, we need to rally the community to ensure that every child has an adult, every child at risk has an adult in their life on an ongoing way. So all of a sudden there was an outpouring of support from the community and they created this entire mentor program across their community that ensured that kids wouldn't fall through the cracks. That's still going. They then went from that and said, okay, well, if we can do that, how do we make sure we're identifying these kids early enough? So they identified an early warning system. Then when they did that, they realized, well, the schools are gonna to have to interact with the communities differently. So the schools changed the way they partner with community groups. So there was this chain reaction that kept going. This, by the way, changed what funders in the community started to fund as well. Mm -hmm. so, so this is one example, but all of this meant that we had to listen differently. We had to marshal our collective resources differently. We had to collaborate as organizations differently. Our institutions had to change the way they work. So they work differently. They would never solve it. Last point, their graduation rate, rate went up by 30%. Really? Yes. That's phenomenal. But you know that sort of uh, support really makes a difference in people's lives. I mean, I did a little bit when I was at Alvernia with our Reading Cleveland Scholars Program. We provided, it was a small group, so it wasn't really big, but we provided support mechanisms for a group of students who came from families that were, were disadvantaged and behind and they ended up being more successful than the rest of the undergraduate population. And it really is that providing that support. Um, I've had, we've had a couple of questions about where they can find the report. Uh, we had that posted here. We'll send that to everybody so you'll be able to access the report. Uh, it is available both in English and in Spanish. So we'll make sure everybody gets to see that. Um, can we spend a little time talking about some of the initiatives that you're proposing? Um, you talked about, uh, uh, hiring teachers that look like writing. That's, that's significant. You know, one of, one of the challenges I think we've noticed is obviously the, the ethnic background, the racial background is a significant challenge in terms of trying to get it to represent what writing looks like. And, you know, teachers that were hired 30 years ago may not look like what writing looks like now. There's also uh, some disparity in the teaching profession between men and women at different grade levels. Do you want to talk about that a little bit more and what, what have other places done? What can we do? And you're right, we're sort of bound by state law in many ways. Yeah, so I'm not an expert in this. Um, we're not experts <laughs> in education. What, what we know is how communities can move. Raquel looks like she has her hand up. Do you want to comment on this? You have to unmute. Raquel, you have to unmute. You're still muted, Raquel. There you go. Can you hear me now? Sure yes. can. Uh, first, of all, first of all, I want to thank you, uh, Richard Harwood, for a wonderful presentation. And as I sit here, you know, I, I have no words to express the way that I feel. 
because you have touched on every single point that I work and talk about every single day of my life. Mm. I, am an, I, I have been an educator all my life. I worked for the Reading School District for almost 40 years. I created a transitional bilingual program for the Reading School District, which was a model on the state, which was eliminated when I retired. I am a commissioner for the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission and the chair of the Education Committee. And uh, I just feel that I am a voice in the wilderness mm -hmm. because even in my own hometown of Reading, I have not ever been able to get this community to take a look at the problem of our youth. Um, our youth are dropping out and being pushed out by the hundreds. Uh, the school to prison pipeline keeps growing and growing and growing. And I see such a complacency. And we cannot blame it all on the Reading School District, I know. We cannot blame it all on the parents either. But most of the time, we are blaming it on the parents. And when we are doing that, we are pointing our fingers to the victims. Because I do not know of one single parent that wouldn't want what is best for their children. Right. But Reading has become uh, an 80% Latino community. And the culture has a tremendous impact on how those parents act and react to not only to our agencies, but also to the Reading School District. Uh, in our culture, because I am Puerto Rican, mm -hmm. in our culture, we believe that the school is the second home and the mm -hmm. parents are the second, uh, uh, the teachers are the second parents. And so when they send their children to school, they believe in their heart that their children are perfectly taken care of. Right. I wrote my doctoral dissertation on parental involvement. And uh, I, I found out exactly how these parents feel about the school and the community. They don't feel that they have one single thing to contribute because they are not educated, which is nothing further from the truth. And the topic that you were talking about, and I deviated from, and I'm sorry about that, was about teachers. You know, it would be ideal if we could find teachers that look like our children so that our children could have role models. But we know that it's absolutely not a thing that can happen just today. Because I know the problems that we have hiring even teachers for my bilingual program in the Reading School District. I went to Puerto Rico to recruit, I went to New York to recruit, and I went to other places to recruit. And it was almost impossible. People did not want to come to Reading. But I think what we need to be realistic right now is teachers that know the culture of the students that they're working with. Teachers that have the humanity to work with the children that they're working with. Teachers that feel what it's like to be the child that they have sitting in front of them. And this is what I, in my uh, humble opinion, this is something that we are lacking. We do not Good. have teachers trained to work with the community. And you know, already most of the teachers uh, and just come to teach it, to Reading to teach. So they are not involved in the day-to-day uh, -day things that are happening in the community either. So um, I don't want to take any more of your time, but believe me, I have lots to say about this topic. Not that I am right about it, mm -hmm. but the feelings that I have, the experiences that I have had, and what I face every single day working with the commission in this uh, subject. And by the way, I'm going to take this opportunity to tell you, Rich, that I have invited you to come to speak at our, we have a two-day conference on school prison pipeline, which is going to be in April. I talked to Monique, and I asked her, her to beg and implore to you to please come <laughs> to and be a, a speaker at our, at our, at our school prison right. pipeline. I'm going to also be a speaker on parental involvement, but Please join me. If you at all can do this, I really would appreciate it, Rich. Thank, Thank you, you Raquel. That's 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 very very helpful, Rich. I don't know if you want to respond to I, the I issue do. about. Yeah, just a couple of quick things, if I can. One is, first of all, thank you so much for your comments, and and my hope, my sincere hope, is that um, you know, if this work continues to move forward, that 
that we can actually meet in person and spend time together. So I'd love to learn from you. Um, I just want to mention underscore two points that you that you mentioned. Um, this point about what every parent wants for their child. You know, when we work with folks in communities, particularly folks who don't necessarily maybe didn't go to college or don't drive fancy cars or don't have high incomes, maybe they're low income, we have this assumption that they want to be fixed, that they're looking for someone to fix them. I see this over and over and over again. And Dave, this goes back to your question about how we do the work. I see professionals who are well-intentioned and well-meaning who think they can fix people. And what I find in our work is that every mother or father that you're just speaking about, they don't want to be fixed. They want to create a life. And they want to create a better life for themselves and their families and their children. They have aspirations is another way of putting it. They don't just have problems. They want to move something forward. They want to create something. And I think, Dave, back to your point, how we do the work, I think one of the ways in which we have to do the work is we have to we have to change our assumptions about people and how we engage with them and how we see and hear them and value the word you used was humanity to value everyone's humanity. I think, I know that sounds soft and I know I'm at the Burke's Alliance and maybe it may not be the, the, the thing that everyone talks about every day, but, and I'm all for measuring results because I want to see impact in people's lives, but, but it starts with whether or not we see people's humanity. And I think that's really critical. The other thing I just want to say is that um, don't stop being that voice, please. Um, because we need more voices to keep sounding that we can move forward in a fundamentally different way and really believe in a genuine way that, that we can create better opportunities, real opportunities in people's lives. And I think that's really critically important. So, so thank you for your comments. Rich, we had a, a question, and I think I know the answer to it, but I'm going to ask it. Um, the focus of your work was on the city. Was there any conversation with people outside of the city? Um, you did talk about... Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, there were some, but we decided, because of the number of school districts you all have, and the way in which they're structured, um, we frankly, welcome we decided that... Yeah, <laughs> welcome to Pennsylvania. Um, and your public libraries are, are, are structured, you know, have their own sets of issues as well and the way they're funded. But anyway, um, we decided to focus on the sitting of Reading because there is a Reading Public Schools district. Mm -hmm. um, and because we believed, we meaning our initial funder, um, our, our conversations with Mike and others, I talked to Tammy White um, before we got started as well because we knew each other from before. Um, we believe that that we could get our arms around this and you could actually create some real change and that hopefully, like when we worked in Flint, Michigan, which is part of a larger county, our work ended up spreading throughout the county, um, I believe it's Genesee County um, in Flint. Um, uh, but we started with Flint initially because we wanted to, to actually create some concrete things. Okay. Um you you identified based on the conversations that you've had, the meetings you've had, discussions you've had, nine different uh, potential target areas of strategy. But you've also said don't don't try to do all nine at once. Right. So, what what is your feeling about what the community would like us to do first and the list, and what is your suggestion about what we might want to look at first? Yeah. So you know Mike and his team at Centro. And we can let Mike weigh in too. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and and let me just say, I, I've had lots of partners in this work um, and and Mike and Centro have been really terrific partners in, in, in moving this forward. And Mike, I think because he's so rooted in the community, um, was able to um, convene a series of convenings when we released the report when I came to Reading. And so, um, I think the sense, and Mike, you should jump in on this, but the sense that I think that's that's starting to emerge, at least, is that there's a lot of energy around pre-K and early childhood, because there's really, you know, going back, Dave, to what we were saying before, there's some good things already happening there that mm -hmm. can be built upon. I think there's some energy around 
English as a second language because it's so fundamental and it's so actionable and doable. And there's some good assets in the community that can be pulled together and marshaled, I think, um, probably accelerated and deepened in a certain kind of way. And I suspect that, and, and Mike can speak to this better than I can, but I suspect that there's some energy around after school work in conjunction with the public schools um, that I know Dr. Murray has expressed some interest in. And Mike, maybe you wanna talk a little bit about that. Sure, so, you know, in, in terms of our constant communications with the district, the members of the community, again, we're hearing about the kids and, and making sure that when the school day is over, that they do have a place to go, uh, whether it's for tutoring support, whether it's for just engagement, whether it's for support for mental health, um, you know, they just, there, there is a need for that in the, in the, in the community. So the Hispanic Center has been reaching out to some members of, of the community and community organizations about that. Is there an opportunity for us to maybe collaborate? Is there an opportunity for the Hispanic Center to maybe lead some sort of consortium around mm -hmm. providing um, after school care supports? Mm -hmm. And I guess timing is everything because the state, uh, the state released 21st century grant funding uh, for the first time in a couple of years that is available. Um, so uh, again, it, it, it aligns very well with, with the work that, that we did with, with the Harwood Report. We're taking a look at it to see um, if, if, if the funding that comes with 21st century, uh, again, aligns with what we'd like to do. Again, the and for those that are not familiar with 21st century funding, it is meant specifically to provide after school programming for Title I schools to meet the needs of children who are struggling um, <clears throat> in the areas of, of, of math and reading and just providing some opportunities for them to engage. So, mm -hmm. so we're excited about the prospects. We're doing our due diligence. And um, again, and, and if it works and it makes sense, um, this is something the Hispanic Center is, is hoping to be able to bring together organizations to provide potentially 21st century programming to meet the needs of some of the children uh, within the community. So fingers crossed, we shall see. Cool. Well, you know, just some quick thoughts about this. It seems to me that it, you're, you're going to want to have a whole variety of, of, of types of activities. We've got Del Shade on the, this Call who runs the Science Research Institute, creating some really neat opportunities for for high school students to learn stuff. Uh, we got Julio Martinez on who works at the Olivets, and the Olivets has done a, a really good job. Parks and Recreation does a whole bunch of stuff. So I'm guessing this is going to be a, a big band that we're going to be creating to do this. But it sounds like it's vital. Yeah, and both of the organizations you mentioned uh, have been contacted, so we're, we're already communicating. And so again, the hope is obviously at the end of the day, the state would have to approve it. Uh, but again, you mentioned it. We're only as strong as the team that we have around us. With the great work that the Science Center does around STEM, what the Olivet does around recreation, what the Hispanic Center does around parental engagement and, and nutrition and food. I just think there's opportunities there listening to what our community shared with us that after school programming is important along with the other the others as well. But these are just opportunities that are in front of us that might be an opportunity to really bring the community together and ultimately lift the community and the kids in the city. So as with this initiative, Dan, go ahead. Oh no, I, I just had a question about the coordination of the after school programming. I sat on a United Way committee and it was great. There was, there was funding, Title I funding for, after, for summer school and there were all this wonderful programming, but it, it looked like if we, did, we didn't go to the neighborhoods to say, when do you wanna have this, um, this activity? It would be you know, from 10 to 12 or from right. 10 to two. Like the, the, it didn't necessarily seem like it would, that it was, coordinating with the needs of the families. And I just was wondering if there can be an effort to really find out what time, you know, in terms of the, uh, the wonderful STEM projects and all kinds of after school or, or summer learning, but that it's somehow more coordinated, that it seems like there's sometimes kids have more than enough to do. And then there's other times there's these big holes where they have nothing to do. Yeah. 
Yeah, what I would just say that this goes back to how we do the work, right? And we talk a lot about alignment between and among organizations, but as you're suggesting, and I think is really critical, I think we need to spend as much time talking about alignment with the community. And what is it that the community really needs to all the points you just raised? And I think that's what's gonna enable things to be effective and to succeed and ultimately to be sustainable over time because they're meaningful. I, I couldn't agree with you more. And I think it's a really critical point that you're raising. Uh, may Leo, I, go I, ahead. May Leo, I Leo is both questions? on the Reading School Board and, uh, and at the Olivet's Boys and Girls Club. So Leo. Uh, yeah, so Virginia's point. Now what the Olivet does, uh, we're, you know, as she knows, we're after school program. Uh, as soon as the kids come out of school, they come to our buildings. We have uh, five clubs and uh, other different sites. Uh, even when the when the schools are closed, we open early uh, for the kids to come to our site. So uh, the problem that I see here is a lot of the kids uh, that are in the city do not belong to our clubs. They have to be members. Now, it's, it's only $20 uh, a year uh, to become a member. And if the parents cannot afford $20, they can get it for free. We don't turn any kids any kids away. Uh, right now, uh, since I am the community outreach director, uh, we are starting to partner um, more with the school district so that parents know more about us so that they know. And in the last two weeks, I've gotten over 30 new uh, parents that have called uh, to sign up their kids. So the word is getting out there. So we're trying to do more uh, to get uh, the parents involved and get the information uh, to the parents that yes, we are an after school program and this is what we do uh, for your children. Not only do we have recreation education, but also we feed the, the kids in partnership with the Hispanic Center. So uh, we're working uh, to what Virginia's uh, point was, uh, what she mentioned, but it's just that maybe a lot of the parents, especially with, with the transient population that we have in Reading, you know, uh, one set of parents know that we exist and send their kids. And as parents move around, uh, they do not know that we are, that we don't only have one club. It's something when people um, mention Oliver Boys and Girls Club, they say, oh yeah, the, the PAL on Walnut Street. Uh, no, we have other clubs, you know, throughout the city. So we're trying to get all this information out so that we get more kids involved in after, uh, after school programs. Uh, thank you, Dave. Sure. Uh, Rich, let me go to a, the, a second one that you mentioned, and that's the ESL issue. And there's a lot of conversation about the need to, to help students in a, in a society where English is the primary language, the major language. I do want to point out that Pennsylvania Dutch is the third most common language spoken in, in Reading, and it's 250 years later. <laughs> it's still here. But some of the employers have, have sort does of... That mean you're gonna, that you're gonna give, does that mean you're going to... I'm going to start talking Dutch, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, but um, some of the employers in the area have actually sort of flipped this on its head and moved very intensively in terms of trying to translate the stuff in their workplace into Spanish so that they can feel like their employees are being engaged. Talk a little bit about how this, you know, I, I understand where you're coming from and think, but talk a little bit more about this, maybe both you and Mike. Uh, Mike, do you want to do you want to kick off on this one? Sure, sure, I can. You know, obviously, ESL is something that obviously continues to be a big need in the community, and you know, the, we have been Hispanic Center uh, takes a, a complementary role in that space because we have some great organizations uh, in our community that are already doing uh, good work uh, in the ESL space, uh, the Literacy Council, Reading Area Community College. So collectively, we are working together uh, around making sure the people that want ESL and want to learn the language can, can gain access to programming at the level that they are. Now, the need is, is, is a large, you know, is, is a big need. And I've been in contact with, uh, with the college and, and with Ryan at the Literacy Council to, to continue to engage around what more can we do? Uh, since the report, again, stressed the community is saying, we need more ESL. What work can we do collectively uh, to try to drive the importance of, number one, helping those individuals to learn English, but also 
you know, again, taking steps to reach out to employers uh, to see what we can do with, with employers um, at their work, what we can do maybe to meet the needs of supervisors uh, to be able to bridge that gap of, of, of communication. So, so the work is important. I think there's a role for us collectively to play in that. We're very fortunate that we do have organizations here locally that are already driving that and, and right. doing a good job with it. Yeah, it, it, you know, just a little bit I know about it, the ASL problem seems to be as much a problem for the parents of the kids as it is for the kids, but it's, it seems to be vital for both. Mm -hmm. And, and w the third target that you talked about was early childhood education. And we've uh, had a number of conversations around the Berks Alliance about that, about how that really is sort of a two generational challenge. It's a challenge for the kids to get them the education, but it's also a challenge for the family who needs the service in order to continue to work. Do you want to talk a little bit more about why you're focusing on that one? Why, what, what that means? What do we need to do? What I think is, Again, I think, as I was mentioning earlier, I mean, we all know that that the extent to which a, a young child gets off to a good start often is the greatest predictor about how they're how well they're going to do as they get older. And so I think the question is, how do we make sure that there are on the one hand, I mean, this is not unlike English as a second language that Mike was just talking about. You know, for everything that we have, there's this demand or potential demand out there and they're not in sync. And so, and the quality of what we're providing may not be in sync with what's actually required. And we may not be meeting families really where, where they are as Virginia was suggesting as well about after school programs. So it seems to me that all of these things are not just about how do we make sure we've got really good programs, which is at the center of this, but what's also at the center of this is that we need to make sure that we're meeting families where they are, where, you know, as you know, there might be transportation obstacles, there may be language obstacles, going back to language, there may be monetary obstacles, um, there may be, as, as was said earlier, cultural obstacles um, that, uh, we need to be in alignment with a, with a changing dynamic community. And I think that's part of the challenge um, that, we, that we face here. I'm gonna call on a, a good friend of mine who's waving at me right now, uh, who has done a lot of work in terms of mentoring school students, particularly high school students at the Olivet Boys and Girls Club. He's also a former teacher. Myrna, do you have something you wanna to add to this conversation? Something, and maybe it was mentioned, I joined late because I was meeting with a counselor at Reading High, um, is that what I find, and I only have maybe 100 kids a year I see, um, many families in this community have, are undocumented. Um, at Reading High, you have, um, most of the students are documented, but their parents aren't. And there is this constant fear. Every essay I read this year and last year talks about, one, the pressure on the kids to succeed because their parents put out so much for them to come. The other one is the fear. Don't tell anybody. Um, a policeman's coming. Put your head down. So the kids live in constant fear. And I think sometimes the parents don't get involved because they're afraid. Um, and having someone who can talk to that, you know, years ago, our Hispanic community was mostly Puerto Rican, so they're part of our country, of course, but today it's mostly Dominican, Ecuadorian, um, maybe even Haitian. At least these are the students I'm working with, and I can't tell you how many times they talk about the fear that their parents have, and somebody has to touch on that to communicate with them, to make them feel comfortable. What do you think the response is to that? Well, I think you can help through the kids. You know, I do through the, when we were, the way I find out most about my students is when they write a college essay. Mm -hmm. And um, if they can communicate to their parents, you know, that's the way to get. But now these are the older kids, I'm not talking about the younger kids. Mm -hmm. Um, 
uh, something I've done this year on a small effort, thanks to United Way, I have matched, and this has been, it was a match the other day, I've matched alumni of mine over the years with Reading High School seniors. And one of the matches the other day, the girl was talking who is undocumented, can't get DACA because she can't get DACA right now, um, and talked to her mentor and said, the mentor was talking about, she all, she was DACA, said, I know the pressure you're under with your parents. And the right away, they connected. Mm -hmm. And if we can do that, more of that connection. Right. You know, right away, the girl went, oh, you understand. And, you know, we have to look at that population. It's not just the Latino people. These are people who live in fear. Point. Good point. It's strong on their kids. They feel it, the pressure very strong. We have a, a question here from uh, a, another educator in the community, Chris Spine, about what role can the churches or the libraries or those kinds of places play in uh, in helping with this? I, I think uh, both are really critically important assets in communities. You know, their um, libraries, you know, uh, we were working with a with a library in Spartanburg, South Carolina, that reconfigured its space. We have lots of libraries that have done this, so that kids could actually, you know, you know, our notion of libraries has has is a bit outdated, right? We think that you're always supposed to be quiet, and you know, libraries really don't function that way in society. Or a lot of libraries don't function that way in society, and a lot of innovative libraries aren't functioning that way in society. So, in Spartanburg, they literally redesign their physical space so that um, students after school could come in and study and use resources and get support, but also make some noise. You know, be young people, be kids. And so, you know, when I think of all the ways in which we support young people, same as Trooper, um, is, is not how do we think about a single go-to place in a community, as I said earlier in my remarks, there is no single organization or group or leader who can solve these challenges that we face. We've got to get over that. We need a collection of groups and organizations in our communities that are working in mutually reinforcing ways with a sense of shared purpose to go back to that theme. And I think libraries could be that. Churches, you know, I was just listening to someone talk about a community they're working in where you know, during COVID, these kids had no place to go. They didn't have any support. Um, and so a teacher, a former educator in a church said, we have so many assets, meaning people in our church who could be providing support to these young people to help make sure they're learning virtually, to help make sure they can do their homework, to help make sure they have a loving adult in their life. And so they came together. This is not a new thing. People have been doing this forever. Right, we don't need new shiny things. We need good, meaningful things mm -hmm. that are actually aligned with the community's desires and needs, as Virginia was talking about earlier. And so yeah. that's really important. Yeah, and interestingly, uh, when the Reading School District did go to virtual education and had to shut down everything, the Olivet's Boys and Girls Clubs, the the libraries. And the several of the churches did exactly what you said. They became places where students could go, could get support, get the help. Right. So here's the question, Dave. When as Reading is moving forward, I just released a piece on this on, on the president's State of the Union, because I hope he addresses this in his State of the Union. We had all we had lots of problems during COVID, but to your point that you just mentioned, you just mentioned three organizations or institutions that stepped forward in meaningful ways during COVID to make sure we were succeeding as a community. What are we doing moving as we move out of COVID to continue to bring those groups together and tap into their innate capabilities and their resources so that they remained a sustained part of community action in our communities? They demonstrated they have the work, the ability to do it. They demonstrated they have the capabilities. They demonstrated a desire. Are we gonna let them just go back or are we going to continue to engage them in productive ways? 
Yes, you're, you're right. I mean, COVID has been very disruptive and sometimes disruptive change creates some very positive sorts of things. Uh, you know, that, that I'm, I'm guessing that the relationship between the schools and the, and the parents was improved somewhat in many ways with, uh, with COVID, those kinds of partnerships and relationships that no, weren't even looked at before COVID uh, are, are, how do we make that then part of the foundation, part of that infrastructure? So we're getting close to the end. What's next? Where do we go from here? I think we are um, in conversations about whether or not we can move this work to an action phase and how that can occur. And those conversations are underway now. And I think all of our hope is, um, I think it's fair to say that there, no matter what happens, there, there are folks in Reading who are gonna take this to the next level. And um, my hope is that the Institute can find a way to continue to support Reading in moving forward as well. So more to come. Mike? Yeah, you know, I concur. You know, this, this work that we did, you know, can lead to so many opportunities for you know, collaborations and so many opportunities to meet the needs of, of, of our kids um, and bringing our community together. So, so we look forward to, to continuing the dialogue with organizations who have already reached out to, to, to me and said, Mike, how can we partner? Where are there opportunities to work together? And as Rich mentioned, you know, we would love to take this to the next level around um, action steps for our community and uh, are excited about the opportunities maybe to be able to share some, some news with, with everyone here and with the greater Reading community uh, in the next couple of weeks. Great, great. So stay tuned. Um, Richard, Mike, thank you. This is uh, both inspiring and challenging. And I think I particularly, and I, th I know if, I think I speak on behalf of the Berks Alliance and probably everybody here that the importance of collaboration is uh, so, so important. You know, the, the, the old saying of uh, failure is an orphan, but success has many parents. That's where we got to get to. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Thanks you, for having us. Uh, Thanks we for having will, us. as I said, make the recording of this and share it with everybody. We'll also give you copies of all the, uh, the way to access copies of the report. And Rich, we're going to hyper sell your book. And, and uh, so we want to thank you for that. We will be having another community forum at the end of March, March 24th, uh, featuring the Federal Reserve Bank, talking about the impact that COVID has had on uh, the workforce, uh, some very interesting changes. So we'll see, uh, see how that goes. And we're looking forward to additional forums and spotlights in the coming months. So thank you for joining us and we hope to see you all again. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.